as we mentioned at the top of the show, Mossy and I were knee deep in Major League Soccer. Uh, let's let can we start in uh, in Atlanta, Mossy? Is that OK? Absolutely. And the reason why is because Atlanta United. OK, um, not only did they win their game in the 94th minute, a walk off uh, uh, winner, but more importantly, they did it in front of 40,000 people. And I, we worked with uh, Marisa Du this weekend, and he actually does the regional broadcast for Atlanta United. So he was actually in the building with 40,000 other screaming maniacs uh, when it comes to Atlanta United. And it it looked awesome. It sounded awesome. And more importantly, it just it felt awesome to hear the volume, obviously the payoff at the end of the game, people running around, throwing beers, taking their shirt off, screaming and yelling, doing all sorts of things. It was, we were, we were almost, almost, but we were almost back to what we think of when we think about uh, the game. And there's going to be other stadiums that are going to open up uh, as we continue on. So uh, here's to heading in, in, the, in the right direction. Now, from a practical perspective, Atlanta United getting a win, that's very, very important. They uh, they need that. Uh, Joseph Martinez still does not look 100%, although he started and played. But this is a good result. And as I said, for me, the big story was that it happened in front of 40,000 people. I, I want to go to 50, and I want to go to 60, and I want to go to 70,000 people when it comes to Atlanta. And I think people are, are salivating and desperate for this type of communal experience that we have missed and has been gone for over a year now and to see it out there and to see them rewarded at the end of the game with that, that, that incredible explosion. Um, it was wonderful. Uh, Mossy, uh, you want to talk about that or, uh, or others or other things that are going on around the league? Well, uh, that was uh, Marcelino Moreno with that 94th. Uh, well, he finally did winner. something. Yes, he's one of those players that Atlanta needs uh, to step up this season. Uh, the other walk-off goal, as you say, uh, was Minnesota. Robin Lud scoring uh, deep in stoppage time in their 1-0 win over Dallas. So they've now won two in a row and are heading in the right direction. Yes, they are. And Adrian Heath is probably breathing a sigh of relief. Now, it's not unexpected in that we we looked at Minnesota United, the way they finished the year, uh, the way that they continued to kind of add and at least on paper look like a better team. Didn't start out like that, losing four in a row. Now they've won two in a row. And this is where these midweek games can really kind of uh, uh, drastically change a perception of a team and, and, and players, and in this case, uh, a coach. Now, obviously he's not on the, on the hot seat having won two in a row uh, this week and kind of, but ultimately they're just living up to the expectation that we had when it come to what the, when it comes to what the loons or we thought the loons were going to be after that. And, 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 and so I think that this is, yes, it's cause for celebration, but if you are Adrian Heath, a little bit of relief, but also a recognition of you're doing what is expected of you and what we have expected from, uh, from this loons, uh, this loons team. What else, Mossy? Well, you brought up Atlanta and the fans and the atmosphere. So we might as well go to Cincinnati next. That was our game on, uh, yep. big Fox yesterday. They opened the TQL stadium, uh, against inter Miami, but, uh, the visitors spoiled the party. They get a dramatic three, two win Gonzalo Higuain on target twice. The first assisted by his brother Federico. And then the second one was a late game winner. Uh, first off, what did you make of the whole occasion and this new stadium and what it means for Cincinnati, but then the match itself. Okay. So obviously, uh, myself, uh, and everybody that was on set, whether it was Sarah Walsh uh, or Marisa Du, we were not in the building. And this is a brand new building, a brand new soccer-specific stadium. I have done these openings time and time again. They never get old. They are awesome. Uh, they are so much fun, especially with these teams and these owners now armed with a history of soccer-specific stadium architecture and building. And each one kind of wanting to impress and outdo the last one. And that's that's exactly what, at least from the word that we got and the pictures that we saw, has been done in Cincinnati. It is a jewel. It is the proverbial cathedral and this touchstone for not just the team and its supporters, but for the community. And there's an immense sense of pride when you see your 
once again, not just your soccer team, but your city, you know, yesterday being put on national TV and it's an advertisement. Now, it's a beautiful box. Cincinnati has yet to find the proper equation to put something beautiful inside that box. And this is a problem. We've talked time and time again about how MLS, maybe more so than any league out there, bends over backwards to enable you to compete right off the bat. I'm not saying being elite. I'm not saying being Atlanta United or LAFC, but at the very least be a competitive team. They give you the money, the resources, uh, the advantages, uh, and the opportunity out there to come in and from the get-go, whether you're in your stadium or not, whether it's a soft launch or a hard launch, to be competitive. Cincinnati has been anything but. Whatever the opposite of that is, that's what Cincinnati has been. Now, as I said, at times you have a soft launch and you're looking towards the stadium. Well, now you're in your new stadium. Cincinnati, you've been around for a few years now. You know what MLS is and what it isn't. You understand, well, we think you understand what MLS is. And yet, it's not for lack of trying. It's not for lack of ambition. And it's not for lack of money. Because this past week, the salary... Uh, numbers came out from the uh, uh, from the uh, from the union, and we start to find a little bit more about how clubs and how much clubs are spending. And you're talking about these two teams, by the way, that were playing yesterday: Inter Miami at number one, but FC Cincinnati at number five. So they are spending money. The problem is that they're not spending money in a smart way. And so that goes to the leadership and that goes to the individuals that are in charge of spending this money. And I in no way want to deter anybody from spending money. I love when teams are ambitious and they back it up by spending money. But you have to have people in place that have an inherent understanding of what the league is and fundamentally understand all of the challenges that are out there and either through their experience and their history in the league uh, or from being out there and pounding the pavement and talking to anybody and their mother that has been around and has made mistakes in the past to make sure you don't repeat those mistakes. You have to have that in place when you are out there spending that money. And too often it looks like that, that while that money has been spent and a lot of money has been spent, it has not been spent in smart ways. And that is reflective on the field. Now, it was an exciting game in that there were a lot of goals, but there is also an additional pressure. I've played in an opening of, of stadium. My friend and colleague Marisa Du uh, play, has played in opening of stadiums. It's not just about the win. It's the win and what it mean, means as you are, in essence, introducing yourself, or in this case, reintroducing yourself to the public, to your market, to the world, and hopefully bringing even more people in. Now, it wasn't a full stadium because of COVID. That will happen here in the next couple of weeks, and maybe that changes the, the atmosphere and the energy in that stadium. But Cincinnati right now is the worst team in the league, and they have been the worst team in the league now for multiple years. And it didn't look the other day that it, like it's going to change on the field despite this brand-new, shiny, beautiful stadium that they have. And so they're going to have to get it right because the people of Cincinnati deserve it for the support and the continued support, despite having a crap team uh, and the knowledge that they have there. There is a history when it comes to soccer and uh, it's a beautiful stadium. And, but if, if the stadium is your biggest star, then you got a problem, but it's still a wonderful stadium. Mossy, what'd you think of the actual game, by the way, because uh, at, at the end, you know, uh, Gonzalo, Gonzalo Higuain was, was massive and was wonderful, as was his brother, to be fair. The one thing I'll say about Inter Miami is I found it very interesting that Rodolfo Pizarro didn't start, didn't come in until the end. It seems like Phil Neville might be moving away from him a little bit, which would be a pretty big story because that was hailed as a uh, landmark signing for MLS to be able to attract a Mexican international at that age. But um, uh, I want to talk about another player involved in this game that was hailed as a landmark signing, which is Brenner. Where's he um, from, Mossy? Again, remind me, <laughs> and the folks out there. Uh, he is a young Brazilian who was signed from Sao Paulo for a club record fee of $13 million. One of the. I told uh, you they're spending money, but are they spending history. smart money? Or are well, they spending the money smart? I guess it would be. Here's the thing his signing triggered a lot of ignorant reactions in Brazil about MLS in general. And I, and I felt compelled to push back against that on Twitter. The problem is all the conversation about his signing 
was about what it could mean for MLS in the big picture and cracking the Brazilian market and creating this pipeline of young Brazilian talent to MLS. There was very little analysis about whether it actually made sense for this player to go to this team. And I know it's early, but the early returns have not been positive. Uh, I, I wonder if Cincinnati are now thinking that that money could have been better spent at other positions. And he's probably wondering, boy, I had a nice thing going at Sao Paulo. I was attracting an interest from um, these bigger European clubs. And if, if I was going to go to MLS, maybe it should have been an LAFC or somebody like that to go to Cincinnati was really taking a chance on something that, you know, <laughs> and uh, I'm like I said, it's early, but so far it's, uh, but look, not I mean, it's not as if he's a different player than he was a few months ago when he wasn't playing in major league soccer. And so you like to think, and this is, I guess, more of a hope that, that people are able to see through and, and, and when they are assessing him to assessing to that they are assessing him w within the context of where he is right now and what he can or cannot do. For example, if he had gone to, I don't know, Seattle or even LAFC, which isn't doing well, it, he might look very, very different or the perception of him may be very, very different. If I was any of those teams that were interested in him uh, right now, I would be maybe sniffing around and saying, all right, maybe his value has changed even in within the last couple of months. But, but but I recognize that he's not any better or worse of a player just because just because a player looks bad playing for FC Cincinnati doesn't mean that that player is actually bad. It's the collective right now that it's just not the right mix of players or the players that they have gotten in. Many of them just aren't good enough, but it doesn't matter it doesn't matter how good you are individually. There's only so much that you can possibly do. Now, I'm not saying necessarily that that is what the case is here with Brenner. I mean, the, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the emperor may have no clothes. I don't know. It's very, very possible. But I do want to give him a little bit of grace in that the fact in the fact that he's playing for not just a bad team, but a historically bad team right now. Well, let's stay in Ohio, uh, a team I was super high on that I, I can't believe what a lousy start they've gotten off to. The defending champs, Columbus, who, uh, whatever you want to call them, uh, they lost to New England this weekend, uh, Toronto midweek. Uh, they are near the bottom of the Eastern Conference standings. Alexi, they have three goals in five games, and two of them were own goals. So the only Columbus player that's put the ball in the back of the net this season is Lucas Elrayan, a free kick against D.C. United. And I know there's been a lot of talk about, well, they've played nine games in 38 days, so it's taken its toll on them. I must say, as a Brazilian, hearing that a team playing nine games in 38 days is a crazy stretch does make me chuckle a little bit, uh, if you know what the calendar is in Brazil right now. But nevertheless, I was super high on Columbus. Uh, I thought they had a great chance to repeat. Uh, they still might get this sorted. I mean, it's very early. But how surprised are you that the uh, reigning champions are struggling as much as they are? Am I surprised? No, because this is MLS, the most difficult league in the world to predict. I mean, we got we got what? Montreal and Colorado uh, that are at least for now looking golden and looking great and looking like the surprises of the year. But of course it, it's May, you know, I got a, I got a question about my power rankings that I did over the, uh, over the course of our broadcasts uh, yesterday on, uh, on Fox. And uh, I want to be very, very clear because I had Columbus at the very bottom of the power rankings, but that was, actually more reflective of the week that they had had, which includes the, the rebrand. So it's on and off the field. So I want to be very clear. My power rankings, whenever I do them, whenever, if, you ever, if you ever see them uh, on television when I'm doing them, they are a subjective reflection uh, of the week that teams have had both on and off the field. So for example, I had Atlanta way up there. And I incorporated the fact that there were 40,000 people there and there was this wonderful moment. So it's not just about winning and losing. It's a lot of different things in the same way, as I said, that I incorporated the rebrand or, you know, the, I don't know if it's a, it's not a failure, but just the bad PR type of situation when it comes to the rebrand of, of, of Columbus out there. But if you're just looking at the actual results, yeah, it's not a good week for Columbus. I still think that they are going to be okay. And I still think Caleb Porter, uh, recognizes that. I don't think it's an excuse, the number of games uh, uh, that they have played, but I think it's also a reflection of, you know, th this crazy league. I mean, if I, if, if you're looking at the standings right now, you got, when it comes to points, you got what five teams in the, in the East with eight points, you got, you know, teams, but it's very, very close. It reflects that parody. Oh, sorry. 
MLS wants to call, wants us to call it the competitive balance out there, but it re it reflects that manufactured parity because of the rules that we talk about when it comes to Major League Soccer, which also makes it very very difficult to predict. Uh, and many people, including myself, looked at Columbus to be much better off the uh, you know right off the bat. But whether it's Columbus or whether it's someone like LAFC that are struggling here at the beginning, you need only look to someone like I don't know Seattle that in the past has really struggled at the beginning of the season only to come on uh, great guns at the end of the season and go on to MLS Cups. So it's, it is it is the proverbial uh, marathon, not a sprint. Uh, I want to save Seattle LAFC for last. So let's do the Galaxy next. Okay. Uh, Chicharito on target again, his seventh goal of the season. They beat expansion Austin 2-0. The only thing I'll say about Chicharito is he should not be taking penalties. Yeah. I know it's a status thing uh, for the star player to show that he's willing to accept that responsibility. And also, uh, it's, it can be a confidence boost for strikers. If they take the penalties, it's a chance to pad their stats and avoid going in droughts. And But you have to make them <laughs> for that to be the case. And he's clearly not good at it. And so somebody else, whether it's Vasquez when he gets back in there, or Legette, uh, there's got to be somebody else on that team that takes penalties better than him because what, the what are the numbers from, uh, what are the numbers from Chicharito? Rito when it comes to penalties? I uh, read he's missed his last four um, and, and his career numbers are dreadful on it from the spot. So, but he did uh, get another goal. As I said, uh, the galaxy went two nil. They're, they're flying they're, they're, they're second in the West. And I'll say this uh, Chicharito is the story, but Greg Vanny to me is the catalyst here. Yeah. Uh, he is doing just an incredible job. I, I know the style of play is completely different, but it almost reminds me of when Jurgen Klopp first took over Liverpool and just how he was able to lift the whole mood of that club and the whole feel around it. So uh, hats hey, wait, off you're to not Greg giving uh, Jovan Karowski any, any credit on this. <laughs> of course. I mean, they, they were the busiest club in the league in the offseason, brought in a lot of new players and guys like Bond and Williams have slotted in Villa Fania, all playing well. So, so are, uh, are they back? Because I get that question a lot. Is the L.A. Galaxy in the way that we that we see the L.A. Galaxy? Are they back? Uh, not in the sense that I think they're going to win MLS cup this season, but I, I, I've seen enough that they're, I definitely expect them to make the playoffs and be a factor and be a, a good team this season. And, and look, uh, you know, despite his, uh, his failures at making penalties, Chicharito continues to score. And I think everybody felt that there was going to come a point where he was going to go to the well and it was going to be empty and it, and it hasn't come, it hasn't come. He's scored in different ways. Um, but also, I mean, even the goal that he scored uh, this weekend, it was a classic type of, of Chicharito in the box, getting ahead of the uh, back line and then, and then slamming it home. So he's playing with an incredible joy right now. We've talked so much about the, the changes that he's made, both physically and mentally. It, it's working. Whatever he is doing, and to your point, I think a lot of it is the way that Greg Vanny has – you know, tweaked things here or there to create a situation that is conducive to a – Javier Chicharito Hernandez style because he's he's very different in terms of a player. He doesn't beat players necessarily one on one. Um, he's not the most gifted when it comes to his his touch. He's not the fastest in the world, but he scores goals and he has a nose for the goal and he scored it in different ways. And while even last year, the amount of crosses that that the Galaxy were, were hitting was was high a lot of them were without purpose. And so I think that there's been a real recognition of how to use Chicharito going forward and knock on wood, he stays healthy and continues on as opposed to LAFC where things are not going so well for Bob Bradley and company when it comes to LAFC. So congratulations to the LA galaxy. I, I I'm not quite yet there to say they are back, but they are flying. Seattle is the best team in major league soccer right now. And it's not even a question. Um, and LA, LA, uh, LA Galaxy are certainly looking very, very good. But again, it's May. Well, I mentioned the Galaxy are second in the West. Seattle is first. LAFC are dead last right now. So why don't we end on what was our FS1 game uh, last night? I'll start with the positive, which is Seattle. I mentioned this word infrastructure last week, and, and you saw it again. I mean, they're, they're just finding ways to win. Uh, the ultimate evidence of that was last midweek when they somehow beat San Jose with Alex Roldan finishing the game in goal. Uh, and then they go out uh, this weekend against LAFC. We're second best for a lot of the first half, didn't play all that well, but kept it at nil-nil. And then 
took control in the second half, getting goals from different players. Ariaga pops up with a goal, his first in his MLS career. Um, Brad Smith, who had never scored goals before, but this season is scoring a lot of them. And and here they are. You know, we hear about the LAFC injuries, but Seattle have been uh, – essentially without Nicholas Ladero this whole season, he's played like 20 something minutes and then without Jordan Morris. Uh, and yet they haven't missed a beat, which again goes to Brian Schmetzer. And, you know, I know we, we, we talk about this a lot. I don't want to belabor this point, but uh, the whole Jim Curtin, Gabriel Heinz, and Michigan sort of shine a light again on this tension between American coaches and the quote unquote, sexy foreign uh, coaches. And, and again, you see who are the ones that are leading the pack here. It's the Americans, uh, Brian Schmetzer. They're in first place in the West, second place, Greg Vanny, third place is Peter Vermees. First place in the East is new England, Bruce Arena. So I'm going to cling to this, that there's something to the fact that, that guys that know this league are, are, are the ones that are more likely to be successful. And, and, and Brian Schmetzer doing it again. Huh? Yeah. I mean, I think that, that, that you hit on it. It's, it's knowing the league, whether you're American or not is, is irrelevant to be quite honest with you, but many more that are American and have kind of grown up within this league are going to have a, a much more, a much better understanding of what this, uh, of what this league is. You know, Brian Schmetzer is the Rodney danger field of this league outside of Seattle. Okay. Um, and I don't think he's ever nece- necessarily gotten or is going to get the credit that he deserves but to your point without Lodero without Jordan Morris and by the way without Stefan Fry who is out now for four to six weeks and has been a constant for a number of years in goal they don't miss a beat they they whether it's the other stars stepping up like a uh, Rui Diaz uh, or uh, or people that uh, that we didn't necessarily see, you know, the, the Roll Don brothers, by the way, this is a week of, of brothers with the brothers Iguain uh, for inter Miami, both starting. And to your point, Mossy, uh, Federico Iguain started for inter Miami over Pizarro, the designated player. So that just shows you how much Mr. Neville believes in, uh, uh, in Federico. And so those brothers there, and then the Roll Don brothers uh, for Seattle, both of them, but, it, but in particular, Christian and Alex for that matter, but, but Christian who has just evolved into uh, a, a great player. I never saw him becoming a great player, serviceable, solid type of MLS player. Yes, but he has become a great player. He has been able to change and occupy that position. I mean, look, he's not Lodero, but he has done some things there as he has been pushed forward that um, hats off to, to him and ultimately to Brian Schmetzer for pushing all the right buttons. It doesn't matter when it comes to personnel, doesn't matter when it comes to formation out there, they figure it out. And they, as I said, are far and away the best team in the league. Now, to your point about American coaches, yes, you have one in Brian Schmetzer that you can point to, but you also have Bob Bradley, who is an American coaching legend that's in last pace, place, and he certainly knows the league. I don't think that they are going to end up there, but Carlos Vela, uh, we saw him at least get on the field, so that's a bit of positive news, but Carlos Vela has been a ghost um, when it comes to playing over the last year. And yes, there are reasons and there has been injuries and there has been uh situations off the field um but lefc without carlos vela they struggle because it puts players in different positions um certainly it puts rossi diego rossi in a position that i i don't think he's comfortable in and i do think that diego rossi's wheels are starting to spin i didn't think that we would be seeing diego rossi in 2021 playing in major league soccer i thought he would have been sold thought someone would have come along and probably he thinks the same thing um, but he is a shell of his former, or he was certainly last night, a shell of his former daring and adventurous and urgent type of self that he has been, especially, I, I like him much better when he stays out wide. He's got that wonderful first touch and that burst of speed and just beats people. But it's very hard for, for him to do when he's being asked to do other things now without Carlos Vela. So I still think that this team is going to be good. It just remains to be seen whether they are going to be great this year. And a lot of us, including myself, had looked at them to be great. But once again, what happens in May is one thing. And when we come up to September uh, and October, we might be talking about these teams and these players and these coaches in a very, very different way. 
No, I agree. Yeah, I mean, if if they get Vel all the way back, I mean, they're so talented that you think they'll be okay. But but this has been a bad start. There is just a bad vibe around that team. So Bob Bradley has to absolutely fix that. They need someone up top too. I mean, they ultimately and they have been searching for a number of years to have that that guy up top that scores goals, takes pressure off, relieves pressure in terms of holding the ball up there. I, I mean like a Zlatan-esque type of person, not necessarily that big, big personality, but it just, it'll free everybody else up. And they just haven't found the right person yet up there that, uh, that can do that. But I do think that they're going to be okay. What do you think, Mossy? Yeah, yeah, I, I okay. think ultimately they'll be okay. Yeah, absolutely. All right. What else? That is it. That's it? All yeah. right, that's a real quick uh, look around what's going on with Major League Soccer. But there, there were a lot of games, and you know, we didn't hit it. You know, uh, Alan Polito scored twice for Kansas City. They're, uh, you know, they're, they're certainly doing, uh, doing well. Uh, we continue to have great games and great goals and, and great young players out there. It's, uh, it, it's turning into a really fun league. And, uh, you know, my, my ups and downs when I come to my, uh, um, you know, my, uh, what do you call it? What, what do you, what, what do you, what do we call that thing where, uh, what I do ups and downs, uh, for all the teams, uh, movers and shakers, movers and, and shakers. And, uh, you know, my, uh, my rankings of, uh, of teams out there, you know, I mentioned like the Colorado Rapids surprise this year, Montreal surprise this year. And then you got your, your usuals was the Chicago fire, Cincinnati, Vancouver's not doing well. The earthquakes lost twice at home, like you mentioned, and and then uh, LAFC. Austin c- continues to be on the road uh, until they open that stadium, and we've seen it time and time again over the years. How how teams have you just got to get as many points as you possibly can, and it gets it gets weary constantly playing on the road until you uh, open up a new stadium. So uh, they had a they had a had a poor week, uh, and then there's a lot of teams that are just kind of in the middle there until we start to uh, figure out uh, what's going on. You like that clip? Well, my State of the Union podcast drops every week. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.